The fairy Delta II was a speed demon, born almost by accident, but began as a stopgap transonic fighter. A silver dart that looked more like a spacecraft than a warplane shattered expectations by breaking the sound barrier on its early flights without even engaging afterburners. On March 10, 1956, test pilot Peter Twiss unleashed the Delta II's full potential. Streaking over France's Chateauroux Air Base, he obliterated the world airspeed record, clocking 1,132 miles per hour, a staggering 300 miles per hour faster than the American F-100 Super Sabre's previous mark. The Royal Air Force seemed destined to adopt this revolutionary breakneck interceptor until Britain's 1957 defense white paper changed everything. Combat aircraft were out, guided missiles were in. The Delta II was grounded before it could even take off. But this wasn't the end. The team behind Britain's fastest fighter found new life for their creation across the channel. It was the fall of 1950 when British pilots flying over the war-torn skies of Korea first encountered a foe that would shatter their entire perspective on aviation. For decades, the British had been at the forefront of warplane development, even leading the world in jet technology with the pioneering Gloucester Meteor. But something had gone terribly wrong. Flying in front of British airmen in Korea was a Soviet jet fighter, faster, more agile, and more lethal than any British warplane. Britain had lost its edge without even realizing it, and with it, it had risked its entire existence. The enemy warplane flying over Korea was the MiG-15, a second-generation jet fighter that made British propeller-based fighters look like a blast from the past. Britain did have jet fighters, but they had not sent any to Korea, confident that there would be no need to deploy their advanced weapons in a conflict where propeller planes would be sufficient. Still, the humiliating truth was that even their most advanced jet fighter back home, the de Havilland Vampire, was considerably inferior to the MiG-15 concocted by the Soviet Union. The Vampire could reach speeds of up to 548 miles per hour, while the MiG-15 could reach 668. The MiG swept wings gave it much superior maneuverability and responsiveness, and its 37mm Noodleman N37 cannons left the 20mm Hispano Mark V cannons of the Vampire far behind when it came to firepower. It was a bitter pill to swallow, but Britain, the nation of the Spitfire, the Hurricane, and the Gloucester Meteor, was trailing behind the Soviets. Something had to be done. Several projects for a second-generation jet fighter were already underway in Britain, but all of them were far from reaching the production line. One of the most promising prospects was being developed by a highly unlikely contender. Ferry, the aviation manufacturer responsible for the iconic swordfish biplane of the early days of World War II, was not known for being at the forefront of new aviation technology. In fact, they were not even known to develop land-based aircraft. They had built a reputation for making reliable, affordable, and durable seaborne aircraft that, while lacking in advanced technology, could get the job done. However, in the early 1950s, Ferry decided to aggressively pursue jet propulsion technology and develop advanced prototypes demonstrating where jet propulsion could go in the short term. Still, jet technology was a given during the early 1950s, and Ferry wanted to explore the use of delta wing configurations in high-speed jet warplanes. Back in the 1940s, the company developed a demonstrator aircraft called the Delta-1. This experimental airframe was Ferry's first plunge into the world of delta wing configurations, and it gave them vast amounts of data to refine the technology, and then envision a delta wing jet fighter that could genuinely make it to the production line and then to the battlefront of the globe. After World War II, British officials calculated that another major conflict would not come in at least 10 years. As such, the production of new combat aircraft was defunded, and in its place, the development of research prototypes was pursued. Under this philosophy, the Ministry of Supply decided Ferry should do more of the same and develop model programs like the Delta I as safe transonic investigations. But Ferry had no patience for half measures. They knew that real progress demanded a real aircraft, a full-fledged warplane, something to push the boundaries of what was known about speed and performance, something that could change how combat aviation was thought of. So they got to work. Originally, 
Ferry envisioned a twin-engine jet that could siphon the raw power of two state-of-the-art engines into one of the fastest-moving things on Earth. But the Ministry wasn't interested. There was already a rival project, the English Electric Lightning, with twin engines and supersonic capabilities. The Ministry suggested a simpler approach, a single-engine aircraft, nimble and lean, that could approach the speed of sound. By the end of 1949, Ferry had concocted something beyond what was requested, an ambitious project named Ferry Delta II. The Ministry was so impressed with the design, it gave it the green light, issuing the official specification for a pair of prototype aircraft. However, drafting the blueprints and making an actual next-generation fighter jet were two very different things, and suddenly, Ferry realized its engineers lacked the experience to build such technology. Their knowledge of high-speed designs was very slim. To fix this, they brought in Sir Robert Lickley from Hawker Aviation in a bid to inject much-needed innovation into their project. The earlier Delta I work also helped as a stepping stone toward what was still uncharted territory. As eager as Ferry was, the British government called the shots, and at the time, they had other priorities. Ferry's Gannett program was labeled a super-priority, leaving the Delta II to fight for time and resources. Yet by September 1952, the plans for the Delta II were finalized, and the real development began. Ferry wasn't aiming to just nudge past the speed of sound. They wanted to obliterate that barrier, and then some, creating a truly supersonic warplane. They also wanted the prototype to be much more than a technology demonstrator. It was designed as an adaptable platform that could easily transform into a future frontline fighter if given the chance. They built prototypes WG-774 and WG-777. The two versions varied slightly in the hardware and capabilities they could offer, but both were based on the same ideals. The Delta II's design was radical. Delta wings swept back at 90 degrees, a sharp pointed needle nose, and the potent Rolls-Royce Avon RA-14R engine pushed it all. The only downside was a tiny cockpit, small enough to fit in the cylindrical hull of the Delta II. These were all part of a series of bold decisions with one objective in mind, raw speed. From the first climb, pilots could tell the Delta II was special. It shot upward like a spear, the droop snoot nose adjusting upwards for aerodynamics and downwards for visibility, while giving it an iconic bird of prey look. Peter Twiss, the test pilot in charge of the Delta II trials, realized this airframe was unique and had an untapped potential that had to be shown to the world. But the warplane would not be wrangled easily. In November 1954, just five weeks after its first flight, disaster struck. At 30,000 feet, the Delta II suffered a fatal engine failure. Twist wrestled with the controls as the ground loomed closer. For the first time, he felt a claustrophobic dread inside the minuscule Delta II cockpit. He was trapped. Instinct kicked in, and his years of experience took over. He did not need a working engine to land a plane. However, the engine was not the only part of the warplane malfunctioning. The rear wheels of the landing gear refused to deploy. It was not going to be an easy landing to survive. The Delta II touched down. Its frontal wheel hit the ground, while the rear part of the airframe bounced violently off the tarmac. The damage to the plane was severe. The prototype would be out of action until August of the following year. It could have all ended there, the plane in pieces, the project scrapped. But somehow, Twiss had pulled it off. He was fine and ready to continue his work. Once repaired, the Delta II wasted no time in proving itself. Prototype WG-774 broke the speed of sound almost immediately without even needing its afterburner. Twiss was certain the warplane was capable of far more. On March 10, 1956, Twist took the Delta II to its very limits in a flight that would make history. He fired up the Avon engine, and the Delta II rocketed off the runway. Over Chateauroux Air Base in France, the daring test pilot pushed his plane harder and faster than ever. Suddenly, the Delta II broke the sound barrier. He kept accelerating and reached 1,132 miles per hour, breaking the world airspeed record. 
making the Delta II the first jet in history to surpass 1,000 miles per hour. Ferry's bold prototype had utterly smashed the previous record set by an American F-100 Super Sabre by over 300 miles per hour. It was a stunning 37% leap beyond the previous record. The event made headlines across the globe. Breaking the record was hard proof. This design was the future of jet combat aircraft, and Britain could once more lead the game. The Ferry Delta II had proven it could break records, but that wasn't enough to save it from what fate had in store. Despite its incredible performance, Britain turned away from the project, shocking aircraft manufacturers across the globe. By 1957, British Defense Minister Duncan Sandys pulled the rug from under British aviation manufacturers by shifting the nation's focus from manned aircraft to guided missiles. Brilliant as it was, the Delta II no longer fit into this new defense strategy. Its promising future was abruptly cut short by a drastic political decision. The engineers and designers at Ferry were heartbroken. By now, they were convinced the Delta II was not just a demonstrator aircraft. It could revolutionize combat aircraft as a mass-produced fighter. They would not let this go without a fight. They pleaded with the Ministry of Supply, submitted proposals for different versions of the aircraft, and even reached out to foreign governments to find support. Germany temporarily showed interest in acquiring the design to create their next generation of jet fighters, but ultimately it decided to go with a domestic blueprint. The Delta II engineers continued their odyssey. They offered the British government a slightly enlarged single-engine fighter and an advanced twin-engine model equipped with radar and air-to-air -air missiles. Ferry believed they could get a new version of the Delta II into squadron service in as little as 18 months. But despite their best efforts, their proposals fell on deaf ears. No one was interested in backing another manned fighter project in an era of radar and missiles. The fastest plane on Earth had no nation to back it up. Yet, its incredible design was not ignored by everyone. Though the British government decided it no longer needed the Delta II, its groundbreaking design caught the attention of the British Aircraft Corporation. The droop's snoot nose, which improved visibility during landings while maintaining aerodynamic efficiency, played a significant role in shaping future supersonic aircraft. The Delta II laid the foundation for the iconic Concorde, the world's first successful supersonic passenger jet. The expertise of Ferry's engineers carried over to the Concorde's development, and many of the Delta II's innovations, like the slender, swept-back wings, Delta configuration, and unique nose, could be seen in the lines of this iconic airliner. However, the challenges were far from over for the people supporting the Delta II by conducting tests and flights using the two available prototypes. Suddenly, the very thing that had made it remarkable became a major issue. Every time the Delta II and other jet aircraft broke the sound barrier over Britain, they damaged buildings, shattering windows and cracking walls. Public complaints poured in, and compensation claims began to mount. Already considerably uninterested in the Delta II, the government banned further supersonic flights over Britain, concluding that the sonic booms were too disruptive for the civilian population. It was another blow to a project that was already teetering on the edge of failure. Rather than let the Delta II gather dust, Ferry sought a new testing ground. They found it in France, where the aircraft could be flown unrestricted by the bans imposed in Britain. Once in France, Ferry collaborated with the Dassault Aviation and the French Air Force, conducting dozens of test flights over French territory in late 1956. The support Britain had denied the Delta II was surprisingly given by the French, who recognized the value and potential of this unique airframe. French engineers studied the Delta II closely. Dassault was in the midst of developing its own Delta Wing fighter, and the Delta II's performance offered valuable proof of concept and field data that accelerated their own development. The British jet became a critical piece in the puzzle of developing one of the most capable European jet fighters of the modern age. The result was the Mirage III, one of the most successful multi-role fighters of the Cold War. Over 1,400 Mirage III aircraft were built, and their success was directly influenced by the lessons learned from the Delta II. And while some argue that the Mirage III was a completely independent design and took no cues from the Delta II, Marcel Dassault himself 
suggested Britain had the technology for a revolutionary warplane long before France, when he said, quote, If it were not for the clumsy way in which you tackle things in Britain, you could have made the Mirage yourselves. <laughs>